All right, good afternoon, everyone. As Kenya said, my name is Rod Burning and I'm with the Brick Kicker Home Inspection. Now I will provide this information at, also at the end, but if you did feel like you wanted to email me a question, you're welcome to. My email is bkhi at sbcglobal.net. My cell phone number is 614-419-1207. All right, folks, as we get started today, I want to be upfront and tell you it's not my plan today to tell you that you have to add services to your business. I'm not going to tell you that you must add services or what services to add. I'm not going to tell you how, how to operate your business. The purpose of the presentation is to give you some thoughts to consider if you decide to add additional services. I know this is listed as market ancillary services. I've got it more as the value of adding the services to your business. As an inspector, we need to understand the difference between the client and our customer. This has been a long standing debate in the real estate home inspection business. In my opinion, the client is the person who is paying me. We'll call that person the buyer. My customer is the person that I'm marketing to. In this case, it's typically the realtor. If I can find ways to make my life, my customer's life easier, the chances improve that I can get more business from my customer. Now, I have repeated examples of realtors in my customer list who refer us numerous inspections a year, who first ref whose first referral to us started out as a simple termite inspection. In fact, I can use the one I did this morning. That referral started out as nothing more than a termite inspection a couple of years ago, and we did 20 inspections for her last year. My number one realtor this year is in the same story. We actually started out by doing nothing but a mold and a sewer camera inspection. We took care of her needs for her because she couldn't find anybody else to do it for her. She then gave us a shot at a home inspection and the relationship was formed. So what is going to be my plan for this session? I'm going to discuss a little bit about how we started our business, why we started to add additional services, how those services helped us grow our business. We will discuss which, uh oh, I got a typo, sorry. We will discuss which things should be considered when adding additional services. This would include training requirements, maybe reporting needs, possible liability issues, marketing considerations, and any potential business issues which may have occurred as a result of adding additional services to our, our portfolio. What I'm not gonna do today, I do not plan on making this a technical presentation. As you will notice very quickly, my PowerPoint skills are very simple, very basic. I had hoped that my wonderful daughter who's a uh, school teacher was going to be able to assist me with some of this but she's in virtual teaching at her school district and she's so busy trying to get her own stuff done she was not able to help me finesse this as i stated earlier i do not plan on telling you that that you must add on to your services i do not plan on telling you that my way is the only way to do it in fact, to be very fair and honest, there are several inspectors or inspection companies who probably do things as well, if not better than us. And please understand that adding services or employees is not meant for everyone. It was a decision I made because I thought it was best for me. Now, before I begin, let me give you a little background on myself and our, and our work. I do currently live in Columbus, Ohio, and yes, I do love the Buckeyes. Whether that's good or bad is up to you. I was absolutely blessed to have met a wonderful, and I'm going to say this not because she's here, but way too intelligent lady who I have been married to for 29 years. We have four wonderful young adult children who are rapidly becoming successful themselves. One is a grocery store manager. By the way, guys, we all talk about the front line of COVID. In my eyes, those were the front line people. We have another who is a school teacher. My third child, 
is a nurse and the youngest is about to start graduated nursing school program. And my wife is a physical therapist, therapist in a nursing home. The reason I said my son's the, uh, the front line of COVID, my daughters were um, heavily protected when they went into the hospital in the nursing home. Uh, my son's walking into a building and hundreds of people in the building and nobody there to help him out. So we have been fortunate. Our children have become successful and are working themselves up. The reason I'm telling you that is because I rely heavily on that team for advice and support. I use their daily work experiences to help me run my business. They have supported me and they have no qualms about telling me when they think I'm heading in the wrong direction. I am sure if you all have families that over the time, you've probably bounced ideas off your families. They've told you whether you're good, bad, and different. And I'm sure you probably listen to what your relatives do at work and figure out when somebody does something wrong, how maybe you can use it to make a better business. That's what I rely on my family for. All right, when InterNACHI approached me about this topic, and this being very truthful, my first thought was, how am I going to fill two hours of time? Well, I think we're going to be able to do it. In fact, as I just told Kenya, if we begin, if you see me looking up towards the clock, I'm keeping an eye on it. If I think we're running short of time, there are some places I can skip through a couple of slides. I've tried to design this presentation, discuss the value of adding additional services to your business. All right, little housekeeping, Ken, you already touched on it. I am allowing some time, hopefully at the end for questions, but I am willing to take your questions throughout the presentation. I'm gonna do my best to answer as many as possible, but please understand that in the best interest of time, I may not be able to answer all questions. That's why I would provide my email. That's why if you feel like you need to call me, you're welcome to. All right, in addition, the information in, the present, in this presentation is based solely on my personal experiences. You may choose to use this information. You may choose not to. But I think most importantly, please remember you are not a home inspector. You are a business. All right, a little history of my business. I started my inspection company in 1994. I keep a very detailed, documented history of our business. To date, we have performed over 27,000 whole house inspections. And I'm estimating, and I have to use the word estimate because I didn't do a very good job in the beginning of counting all of them. We have performed over 30,000 additional inspections. What's an additional inspection? Could be termite, radon, mold, you name it. Now, I currently have a staff of two inspectors plus one going through InterNACHI training. I used to have five inspectors. I won't go into that. It's for another session. We are down to two. All of my inspectors belong to both, forgive me, ASHI and InterNACHI. For, my, for the record, my ASHI number, my certification number is 112177, and my InterNACHI number is 1612021. And I have a, currently have a state of Ohio grandfathering license number. I'm a state of Ohio licensed termite inspector, a state of Ohio licensed radon thermographer, or inspector, I mean, I'm a level one certified infrared thermographer. I've also attended and been certified by Monroe Infrared. I am currently trying to get recertified as an energy score assessor through the Department of Energy. I was an idiot. I went through the program, completed it, didn't follow up on it, and I got dumped from their program for not, you know, basically doing their inspections. I also am a certified swimming pool inspector, and I'm a member of the National Association of FHA Consultants. Now, I was Honduras College Instructor of the Year for 2002 and 2003. For those that are not from Columbus, Honduras College is a local real estate training program. Uh, they teach real estate, nursing, appraisal, home inspection was one of their sides. I've also taught courses nationally for ProStar Academy, which is affiliated with the Brick Kicker Franchise Training Program. Now, I bring up the Honduras thing because again, 
when I would teach the Honduras classes, it was for people that were wanting to get into the home inspection business. What I picked up on a lot of times from people in the audience was they weren't looking at this as a business. They were looking at literally starting a job. And I want to stress that we are a business. I'm also the vice chairman of the state of Ohio Home Inspector Licensing Board. Again, for anybody that's not in Ohio, we are dangerously close to finalizing that licensing bill. If you are in Ohio uh, and you are not a grandfathered approved inspector, be very aware that looks like the date is July 1st that's, that will be announced. I believe that's gonna be announced and that is the date that all the new rules go into effect. And I'm also a board member of the Ohio Association of Radon Professionals. Now, why am I telling you all this? It's not because I'm better than anybody listening to me. I just want you to know a little bit about me so that you know that I can take, that I take my profession seriously. All right, why did I start my business? 1994, I'm young, I'm a little bit stupid, I'm very arrogant and cocky. And I got really mouthy one day at work and I got fired from my job. The issue with that was my wife was pregnant at the time with our first child. For years, my wife had heard me say I wanted to start my own business. So when she found out I lost my job, she basically gave me an ultimatum. Get a job working for somebody, someone else or start my own business. When I told her I wanted to start the business, she made me a counter proposal. She said yes with a condition attached. I had to have income coming in because the business was not going to be making money at the beginning. So I jokingly said we began our negotiations. I got a full-time job selling car repair services at National Tire, a service company called Firestone. And I worked my inspection business on a part-time basis. The first six months, I did a whopping 34 home inspections. But what I did was I marketed the business. And again, guys, you can't learn better about marketing home inspection from anybody in the world other than InterNACHI. I'm not saying that because we're on the program. I'm saying that because it's from what I can tell is basically the truth. So in the next 12 months, I did 153 home, ins uh, home inspections. And again, just to be very clear, I did my very first home inspection on May 25th, 1994. So 34 jobs up until the end of December, 153 full home inspections the second year. During those home inspections, I watched different inspectors walk in the door. There were termite inspectors, there were septic inspectors, there were radon testers. All these people were walking in during my home inspection doing services and they were getting paid for them. At the same time, I watched the Firestone service technicians bill for more than one service at a time. My job at Firestone, I was the guy behind the counter. When you brought your car in for service or an oil change or tires, whatever, I'm the one who took the order. So when people would come in and say they were having a diagnostic issue or an engine issue, I took the order, handed it to the technician, he went out, did the work, came back to me, told me what needed to be fixed. It was my job to sell the service to the customer. I am not a car person. What I learned was that he was able to do certain things to uh, two services at the same time. He would have the computer running to diagnose an engine issue while he was changing the oil or while he was rotating the car, the tires on the car. The technicians were getting paid by the service that they were doing. That made me start thinking about our business. I'm sorry, back up. So what got me thinking about the business was the day a customer came in and he had a water pump issue. The technician reviewed the vehicle, confirmed the pump was leaking. Again, I have no knowledge of a car. I had no idea what had to be done to fix it. I priced out the water pump replacement at that particular car required removing the timing belt, the removing the hoses and draining the coolant. I gave the customer an itemized list of each of those. The customer came back and said, can you cut us a break? Can, is there some way you can discount this a little bit? When I asked our store manager, he said, yep, 
we can do it. it it's not something we want to do but he would do it because basically they had to take the timing belt off they had to re remove the hoses and drain the fluid to replace the the water pump so in essence to do the water pump we were doing a lot of the other things that we had to bill for this allowed me to make a deal with the customer by doing so, we made money on the job, the technician made money, the customer felt satisfied, and that customer became a, a client of ours, and he kept coming back to the store with other cars. Ultimately, the store made money. So this made me start looking at my own home inspection business. As I said, I'm watching termite guys walk in the door. I'm watching radon people walk in the door. And I looked at it and said, wait a minute, I am looking at four joists. I'm looking at band boards. I'm looking at exterior face, exterior facial boards. I'm looking at all of this stuff that may be the cause or it may have been created by wood destroying insects. So, so why, I said to myself, why don't I become a termite certified home inspector? At that time, home inspectors in Ohio did not do termite inspections. They were home inspectors. I got certified and I was able to start making more money because the biggest thing I was doing is I was helping the realtor out. So we talked about the value to the realtor. It was, I was starting to make their life easier because I could get inspections done in one visit without the realtor having to schedule multiple visits to the property. This created less stress on the seller, less issues for the realtor to remember things, they didn't have to worry about making sure that services were completed. All right, again, why did I provide that info? I think because when I started this business in 94, I was a home inspector. That meant I only inspected and only got paid for the home inspection. And I also wanted to try to find a way to grow my referral list. This is marketing now. As I said, I did 34 home inspections in the first year. That meant I had a maximum of 34 referring partners. That's it. As a business owner, I will try to attend one training, at least one training continuing education class every year. During one of my early, early meetings, there was a gentleman that came in. He had sold his home inspection business and he was talking about how to grow your business. And he made a present a statement that completely blew me away that day. His statement was, and I, if you, and if you don't do this yourself, I would challenge you to look at your data for a minute. He said your average realtor referral per year is approximately two home inspections. I absolutely thought that was a bunch of bull, and you know what, bull dung, and because I, I won't say the word. I, there's no way that is the average. I went back home and I looked at my list from the rear before, from the year before, and I realized I was absolutely dead wrong. I suddenly realized I could not rely on the realtor for all of my business. All right, in our early years, FHA required a termite inspection be performed on, on all FHA financed homes, whether it was a purchase or a refinance. So I started to say, why couldn't I keep that termite money in my pocket? At that time, in my market at least, the termite expense was the responsibility of the seller. That never made sense that you would ask somebody to pay for the termite inspection, especially when they're selling the house. The buyer only paid for the home inspection. So here I was going out doing the home inspection, the seller's agent is hiring somebody else to do the termite inspection. They were hiring the termite contractor who showed up seven to 10 days before closing. Um, you know, or if they, if they remembered it, it was seven to 10 days before closing. Uh, all of a sudden, the termite inspector would say, hey, we're not available. We're booked. We can't get to you. Now the realtor was stressing. What if they couldn't find somebody? They were scrambling for an alternative person. They eventually started to find out that we did termite inspections. The realtor called and asked if we could do it. Sure, we can do it. We began again to grow our database by the use of that 
additional ancillary service. All right. The other thing the termite uh, company was doing was um, if they found any damage, they would then check the box that there was damage. Now, there's a person up line in the mortgage business that I refer to by a name, and I, and I please nobody be offended by how I refer to this. I'll tell you why I do it. I refer to the underwriter as God. And the reason I refer to the underwriter as God is because God can't call you back. They will, he will not or she will not call you back. I have a very good friend of mine whose sister is an underwriter at a bank. I was in the room one day when he called his sister, called her by her legal name, which her sis, his sister doesn't go by that name. The person on the phone said, I'll have her call you back. I mean, he couldn't even call his own sister. So when the box was checked, whether we did it or a termite treatment company did, they checked the box damage, the underwriter would then send down the list. Now we need a structural engineer to come out and review the damage. Now I put the words ding, ding, ding next to it because I don't know how to make a bell sound. This was an opportunity to make more money. What if the property I was inspecting had a private well or septic? Who was doing those inspections? Let's repeat what I just said in the previous slide. Ding, 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 again, an opportunity to make more money. What if the buyer wanted radon testing? At that time, our realtors were only calling the local radon mitigation contractor. So again, just like with pest control people, I began to hear the same comment. Why do I want to hire the termite or contractor? Why do I want to hire the radon contractor to do the inspection? because all they are going to do is find something. I wish I had an independent person to call. Thus, I became a radon tester. Same applies. What about mold testing? What did I need to do this type of testing? So a few minutes ago, I said, I go to at least one continuing ed class every year. As much as I go, as much as I want to and enjoy going to the home inspection classes, I try to find myself attending another inspection related seminar class uh, program every year, whether it be mold, maybe it's this year's mold, last year, by the way, was sewer camera, uh, maybe it would be termite, maybe it was radon, anything I can do to continue to learn more about the business because I wanted to be able to talk intelligently to my client, intelligently to the customer, and act like I was knowledgeable and an authority in my service, because if they were comparing me and another inspector, I wanted to make sure that, they, that my client, in this case, the buyer, was comfortable in hiring me. All right. Now I'm gonna give one example on the value of adding on services and I'm sure we all can relate to this service or to this example, I mean. My wife and I went to dinner at a local restaurant where my, my daughter was serving. We sat down, we obviously were there because my daughter's working that night, up walked my daughter, asked if we would like to order something to drink while we looked at the menu. She might as well have brought the wine and the beer with her because she knew we were gonna order. So we ordered a, a glass of wine, we ordered a bottle of beer. And I will say right now for the record, I am the grocery shopper in our house. I knew that I could buy the entire bottle of wine, which my wife just ordered a glass of for about $16 at the store. And the six pack of beer that I was drinking would cost approximately $6.99. However, the restaurant was charging $9 for the glass of wine and the beer was $4.50. We ordered an appetizer of jalapeno poppers. The cost was $6 to our bill. There was an order of six poppers in it. Again, being the shopper, I knew that I could buy a box of those at the store for approximately four bucks and it contained about 15 poppers in it. I knew for the dinner that we were buying, uh, which we bought a steak dinner that night was about $20.
when we were done, we were both in a good mood. We decided to splurge. We ordered another round of drinks and we ordered a piece of very chocolate cake that made my wife happy. That piece of cake added $8 to our bill. So when we were done, and guys and gals out there, I'm sure you all can relate to this. Our bill suddenly was approximately $81 before tax and tip. I knew that at the store, if I bought it and made it at home, we'd have had a bottle of wine for $16 and she had about a half a bottle left. I would have drank the same two beers, but would have had four left over. The steak, the potato, the salad would have cost less than $20 to make for one person. And we were paying $20 each. And the appetizer and the dessert would have cost less than $10 basically less than 50% of what we were paying. So let's consider that exercise for a minute when it comes to purchasing a house. The buyer contacts a realtor about looking for a home. In this case, I'm gonna call the real estate office, the restaurant. The buyer meets the realtor and I'm gonna to refer to the, buyer, the realtor in this case of the restaurant hostess. The buyer's making an offer on the home and gets the offer accepted. And now the buyer has a table at the restaurant. The hostess, again, referred to as the realtor, informs the buyer that they should contact the server, who is us as the home inspector, to discuss what we would like to eat at this time. Early in my life of doing this, we had debated making our marketing brochure look like a restaurant menu and kind of having some fun with us. We were going to have us all dress up and put chef's hats on, et cetera. And, you know, we we're going to have like, a, uh, like an appetizer part of the menu, which was going to be the, the termite inspection or a well or a septic, something like that. We were going to have the main entree. We were going to have dessert, which you know could have been radon testing. We were going to have a little fun with it. We just never followed through on it. Again, partially, I'm not uh, good enough at, at certain parts of technology to you know how to work that. The home inspector, us, is going to ask the buyer what service they, services they desire to get completed. So let me stress up front to you guys and gals. I answer my own phones. I currently do not use one of the scheduling services to do it. They are very good services out there and I haven't made a commitment to one of them yet. I answer our phones because I'm the one that controls our schedule. I wanna make sure that I know what's going on. In this case, the entree of that example is the home inspection. That is our meat and potatoes part of our business. I can't remember if I have this in a couple minutes, but in my business, the home inspection is about 60% of our income. All right, the question then becomes, does the buyer want a beverage such as termite inspection? Do they want an appetizer such as a radon test? Do they want a dessert such as a mold test, sewer camera, et cetera? In 2020, we had 245 referring agents. So again, I challenge you all, if you're not doing this, I said, you are a business. You're not a home inspector. If you work for somebody, it's different. But if you are the owner, you are a business. You need to know your business numbers. If you wanna market, you need to know where those agents are. You wanna know where your business is coming from. So we had 245 referring agents. Again, we as a business, and, and, and guys and gals, I'm 59 and a half years old. I have slowed us down a little bit in the last couple of years on purpose. That number used to be higher, but we've kind of reduced the number to focus more of our energies on the ones giving us work every day. All right, a referring agent. They can be a realtor. They can be a mortgage agent. They can be a title company, et cetera. These are hard numbers from last year, so bear with me. I'll bore you for a minute, but we had one realtor who gave us 22 home inspections for last year. One realtor gave us 20. 
Another gave us 19, another gave us 18, one gave us 17, three gave us 16, two gave us 15, and two gave us 10. This seems very consistent with what I have noticed in the last 15 to 18 years of tracking our numbers. Every year there's the top 10 realtors, top 15 realtors in our database give us 10 or more home inspections a year. There's usually one or two or three who give us close to 20 a year. Then there's a big drop. Six of them gave us eight home inspections last year. Four gave us seven, five gave us six, six agents gave us five home inspections, 12 with four, 17 gave three, 43 gave us two, and 128 were the what, what we have referred to as the one hit wonders. I don't know if they're part-time realtors. I don't know if they're agents that have affiliate, you know, I'm not saying affiliation is the wrong word, loyalty to another inspector and their inspector was busy and we picked up the, the, the scraps. I always think, tend to think these are more of the one hit wonders are the part-time agents that do this for hobby money because they're not committed to being a full-time realtor. These were our hard numbers of, and when I say it's a referral, I am talking about own, uh, any inspection that we did that had the word home inspection attached to it. All right, we did 679 home inspections. We divided that out by 235 agents. The average number of home inspections per agents was 2.88. As I said a few minutes ago, the average you get per agent is two. And when I realized that number was legit and I started tracking it, I, I really dawned on me, I had to expand our marketing base. I couldn't have 10 or 15 or 20 realtors that I could count on. When I was teaching, I used to make a statement that said, you need to have 12 agents that gave you one inspection a month. If you could get you know, and I guess it depended. I actually used to say you need 30 agents a year that would give you one inspection a month because of the full-time home inspector, 30 jobs a month. I know it's it, people may say, no, I can do more than that. But when you start doing 30 to 35 home inspections a month, you're working a very full-time schedule. Well, by the way, we don't have, if you notice those numbers a minute ago, we don't have 30 agents giving us 30 home inspections a year. All right, last year we had another 12 agents refer us billable income, which did not have a home inspection attached to it. That could have been termite inspection, could have been structural inspections, it could have been well and septic, whatever it is. It could have been that the, another home inspector did the home inspection, but wasn't certified to do the termite, wasn't certified to do the well and septic. That's where we came in. The average dollar received per referring agent in 2020 is $1,334. Again, not a lot of money. You need to expand your base. All right. Why did I tell you that story? I just kind of went over it. But to break it into just a tad bit more numbers, 50% of our inspections last year added on a termite inspection. 8% added on a well a test or a septic only inspection or a combination well and septic inspection. 38% added on a radon test. If you don't live in a state with radon, I realize that's, you know, it's going to be hard for you to use that, but 38% of our clients added radon testing. Now, this number went way down for us in the last couple of years. 1.3% added on an FHA slash VA type inspection. 5.6%, and this has gone up by the way, added either a reinspection or a mold test or a sewer camera. In 2020, our average home inspection size was 2,074 square feet. The average home inspection fee, and for my business, and I, I have to say before any negotiated discounts or coupons, I haven't put a coupon out in a long time, but every now and then I got to negotiate a deal, was $401 for that size home. 
The average termite inspection was $72. The average well and septic was 201. The average radon is 151. Certification fee is $419. And the average other fee, no home inspection attached, is $213. These numbers I'm putting out there because later in this presentation, I'm going to refer back to some of this information. All right. Now, question is, why would you not want to add on services? I'm putting on there, why should you? I'm putting on there for those numbers right there, I was able to add on additional income to our business. I can tell you that year to date, our business is down this year compared to last year in numbers of home inspections completed but is almost equal to the amount of income year to date that we did last year. All right, why would you not want to add services? Maybe you don't want to deal with the extra equipment needed. Maybe you don't want to do extra paperwork to your service. Maybe you don't want to deal with the extra state required reporting issues. Maybe you don't want the extra liability associated with these inspections. They're all fair. They're all very legitimate considerations. But let's try and look at each one individually. And for this purpose, please remember, I live in the state of Ohio. So if I reference the state of Ohio, I'm kind of referencing it from what I know. But I think this is pretty consistent in a lot of states. All right. To be a termite inspector. In Ohio, I have to have a very specific license to do that inspection, and I must have another very specific license to do the pest control treatment. So I can go become a licensed wood destroying insect slash termite inspector in Ohio. All I have to do is complete the license application, pay a $35 annual fee, and pay $35 for a business inspection license. That is basically all I have to do financially to become a termite inspector in the state of Ohio. I must take an exam. Once I'm passed, I have to give up an entire day to go sit through a class on how to write a termite report. And oh my God, is that boring? It is a, one of the worst days I've ever sat through. And I must remember that my license is good for 12 months and it must be renewed annually. I am required to carry insurance as a home inspector. Unless your state license requires it, you're not required to have insurance to go do a home inspection. I personally think that's silly. Um, we've been, as I said, 27,000 home inspections. We've been in litigation. I'm glad that we had insurance when we got there. It made me rest more comfortably at night, but I'm not required to carry it. As a termite inspector, your state may require that you carry insurance. I personally am required to attend a full day CE class every three years on pest, uh, pest issues. For the record, 30 minutes of that day are dedicated to termites or wood destroying insects. The rest of the day is reviewing other pest issues as most of the attendees are pest control applicators. And you will be subject to a random, unannounced state visit every three years in which the state comes in to review your files to make sure your license is complete, your insurance is up to date, to make sure you're using the correct report, et cetera. They did my last random visit on December 23rd. And I was laughing when I heard the doorbell ring and I looked out the door and there stood the dude with a pest control uh, state of Ohio jacket on. And I just started laughing and I said, why today? He goes, because I knew you'd be home. It's exactly what he said. All right. I am required to have an approved report, but I think all of you understand that if you're doing pest control inspections, you realize it's the NPMA 33 report. All right, this is again, my opinion. The biggest issue we've encountered to get into this type of business is the lack of training 
on how to do an inspection and how to determine if a finding is active. I know that when I passed my license test, I looked at the state employee and said something to the effect of, great, now when is your class on how to do the inspection? And his answer was, there isn't one. Congratulations, you are now a termite inspector. That was his answer. I'm never going to deny that the first time I saw a subtraining in termite was during an inspection when I knocked open a tunnel and saw the maggots running around in the tunnel. It took me a minute to realize what I was actually looking at. I also am going to admit that before I got into being a pest control inspector, I lived in a house that was having swarmers. I didn't know what they were. At that time in our profession, I did all of our reports being done by hand. So I'm sitting against the couch, we're watching TV, I'm writing up today, the day's reports, and there were gnats flying all over me, at least I thought they were gnats. So, you know, I'm kind of knocking them down, not thinking anything about it. Next day, I get a call at work, so my wife said, hey, we have winged ants all over our floor. That's how I realized, and that's how it was confirmed that we had termites. All right. I believe that it's very important that we understand the type of insects we are looking for. And folks, if I'm going too quick, please stop me. I realize right now I'm a little bit ahead of my projected time of where we should be at this point. So if I'm a little bit quick, please let me know and I'll slow down. Um, you should know what they look like. You should know what the damage or exit holes may look like. You need to know conditions that are conducive to their infestation and common places you may find them. Now, I'm gonna kind of reiterate, I use these services to expand my realtor base, but I use these, these, this knowledge of these services on how to sound more credible to my client when they are comparison shopping our business against another inspector. You need to know the difference between a termite swarmer and a flying ant. You need to know the difference between a termite swarmer and a flying carpenter ant. And you should probably know the difference between a carpenter ant and a regular ant. And there's, these are all things that make us look like professionals, makes the realtor have confidence in us, helps the realtor get uh, the ability to feel comfortable in referring us because they want to make sure that we don't make them look foolish to their customer. It's another thing I always said when I was teaching before is I would ask all the students in the room, who in this room knows a realtor? Now, almost everybody's hand would go up. And then I would say, who in this room has been told by the realtor that when you get into the business, they will get you some business. And a lot of hands would go up and I'd look at them and say, don't count on that. First of all, as I said, many realtors only would give you two jobs a year. So great, your friend Joe is giving you two inspections for year that year is five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars enough to support you financially for the year. No. Second thing is the realtor needs that buyer to be comfortable and confident in them to refer them to more friends to make more sales for the realtor. If the realtor is going to recommend you as an inspector, they want to make sure that you are a competent person also. If they recommend you and you are incompetent, lack knowledge, uh, embarrass the realtor, you're going to lose the business. So this is why I say we need to know the differences between these people or these, uh, these insects, I mean. Another big issue that we dealt with was the concealed finding issue. Now, to be fair, I think this item blends easily into the poorly written report category. The current termite report, if you want to call it that, allows you to list any and all obstructions encountered during the inspection. A finished basement should list what obstructions exist. It could be fixed walls, it could be fixed ceilings, it could be installed drop ceilings, installed appliances, whatever. 
That's a very, very important when your client moves in and rips out that existing yucky finished basement materials and discovers evidence of wood destroying insects because their first instinct is to either call you, there's actually one part, person missing on here, it should be to call you or they call the pest control contractor who will likely tell them to call you or they'll call the realtor who will tell them the same thing. So again, from our end of it, as we market our services to the realtors, we market the service that were, in that were knowledgeable, competent, and qualified in what we do that will help the realtor have confidence in us when they refer us to somebody else. All right, radon testing. Again, sec second leading referral source in our business. In Ohio, I have to have a state approved radon tester license. Again, just like pest control in Ohio, there is a license for testing and a license to be a mitigator. As an Ohio Association of Radon Professionals board member, I make a presentation at all of our continuing education, uh, continuing education classes. And we basically have kind of dubbed it, what did the inspector see? And I go back and look at some of my inspections and things I hear about, and I put it out there for the group to discuss. You know, it'll be things like, okay, you've shown up and you don't know where to put the test. You've shown up and it's a very large basement. You've shown up and you've got a result that you believe has been doctored. Or you show up and the buyer's asking you questions about the mitigation system. What are you allowed and what are you not allowed to say? To become the licensed tester in Ohio, I have to take an approved course and I must pass an approved exam. I have to submit the quality control plan for the state's approval. Um, Ohio and about, I think five or six other states, I know Ohio is, is pretty particular here. They, they, we give them a plan and we have to stick to it. Uh, they are pretty, um, diligent with us about making sure that we follow the rules in Ohio. The QC plan must list what type of equipment you intend to use, and it must be specific to that equipment. So as an example, when I first set up my license, I thought I was only gonna be using Femtotech monitors. So my QC plan was based on their equipment. At one of the national conferences, I met people from Radstar, um, talking to them, I said, look, I will use some of your equipment too. So I started using the AccuStar Radstar monitors. Well, when I went to renew my license for the first time, the state said, hey, uh, dummy, where is your QC plan for the Radstar equipment? I said, what do you mean? They said, you set your QC plan up for Femtotech. We need Radstar. I literally had to resubmit an entire new QC plan. And I'll be the very first to admit that 20 years ago, my paperwork capabilities were weak. Um, I'd find myself doing the inspections, cashing the check, and paperwork was just a second thought to me. And I'm, I hate to admit that, but it's true. Um, so it when I would get these types of requests from the state, hey, we need an updated QC plan, or we need this, or we need that. It was very difficult for me to uh, complete those tasks. And so that's why when I say, if you're gonna get into these extra services, and you wanna market them, be prepared that you will have to understand what your state wants and also begin to understand what the mortgage company may look for. Um, jumping back a minute on the termite inspection, we'd go out and list, Found wood uh, carpenter ants, great. Found termites, great. Next box down, damage. If you checked that box and said there was damage, it may have been no big deal. There was damage. Problem would be the underwriter sees that box as damage and then they insist that there would be a structural engineer or they insisted a contractor come out. So we had to begin to understand what the mortgage underwriter was looking for, what the buyer might be thinking, what the seller was thinking when they saw the report. In Ohio, my licensing fee is $400 every two years. 
again, I'm a business. I need to understand that fee is going to come up. I know he's not on the call today. I have a good friend that is not the very best at managing his, his um, financial affairs. And when these fees come up every couple of years, he is struggling and scrambling to try to figure out how to make that payment to the state so they can renew his license. We need to account for this. We need to be prepared. We need to understand the financial implications with adding the extra services to our business. All right, once licensed, I'm required to submit quarterly summaries of all the tests performed to the state. Again, more paperwork to maintain, more files to keep, um, more information to be able to justify if sub, uh, subpoena is the wrong word, but if inspected by the state. When that termite Department of Agriculture gentleman showed up at my front door, he basically asked for a list of our inspections that we had done that had termite inspections attached. I gave him the list. He said, I want this report, this report, this report. He picked five reports. I had to go produce the reports right then provide them to him for his review and approval to make sure they met the state requirements. By the way, that included making sure they were signed. Oops, <laughs> we had two that weren't signed of all things. So that got, you know, got, got it, he got a little bit cranky with me for that reason. Every two years, I'm required to attend 16 hours of state approved continuing education requirements or education. Again, additional expense, and additional time. All right, some of the challenges I deal with in, lic in licensing is that Ohio requires that I submit an attempt to renew my license 90 days before the license period ends. All right, God love you know people that don't have the same annual date to renew a membership or a license or a certification how great would it be for all of us to know that our internachi dues renew on the same date our termite license renews on the same date it keeps it easy for paperwork if you are a multiple inspector company and you have say five inspectors and you have five different dates that you have to renew your license and you can't renew it for 90 days before you literally have to have marks and stuff in calendars to say, today is the day that I'm supposed to renew Joe's license. Well, I am out doing inspections today. I have inspections tomorrow. Okay, I'll get to it in a couple, three days from now. A couple, three days later, you're busy doing something else. A couple, three days later, doing something else. And all of a sudden you realize you have forgotten to renew his or her license. All right. Um, we need to remember these types of dates, remember information, re um, account for the expenses, account for paperwork that we're going to have to do to add the services to our business. All right. The biggest issue we're going to deal with is the realtor is determined, and in radon, I should say, the biggest issue I'm going to encounter is the realtor has determined that radon is not an issue. I know in this world of inspection, we've all dealt with the realtor says, oh, it's just radon, it's no big deal. I wouldn't worry about it, don't worry about it, nothing's, it's just a bunch of hooey, whatever it is. We also are gonna deal with that seller who breaks the closed house condition requirement for the inspection. And I'm sure all of you that do the inspections are going to realize and probably recognize and acknowledge, whether it be publicly or secretly, that the best time to do a radon test is in the middle of the winter or in the middle of the summer when it's really hot or really cold out because homeowners tend not to open the windows during those conditions. Here in Ohio today, it is 60 degrees. And I'm having to please stress to every single seller that I can do not open the windows till we come back Friday night or do not open the windows till we're here on Saturday. Because when we come back and the, the closed house is compromised, theoretically our test is no good. All right. 
Um, opening that window violates non-interference testing conditions. Theoretically, you're supposed to add a minimum of 12 hours to the test period or start the test all over again. This is a topic that's on my presentation in two weeks for Ohio Radon is what do you do when you show up and suspect that closed house conditions were compromised? Uh, what do you do when the realtor has put seven days inspection period in there? What do you do when they're scheduling the inspection on the fifth of seven days and you're gonna pick the radon up on the seventh day and you show up and the dining room window is open or the living room windows are open? All right, this can create significant issues for me in managing our schedules. Uh, again, I did a presentation to a local board of realtors last year, and I talked about the fact that I, I called it the inspection process. And part of that, the presentation was, please remember when you write a contract and you write a five-day inspection period, you may think you're doing a client a favor, but you're doing the worst possible thing you can do for your client because your client no longer or may no longer have the ability to actually pick the inspector they want to hire. They, the preferred inspector may be busy. The preferred inspector may be out of town. I, I'm going out of town for a, a four day R&R &R with my wife tomorrow. I lost an inspection for this weekend where the realtor wanted me to do it. And I told her I was gonna be gone. And I gave her my other gentleman's schedule and she goes, okay, I'll see you on the next inspection. And that bothered me last night. First thought was, what did my other inspector do? Did he do something wrong? And a friend of mine this morning said, nope, probably not. She probably prefers you and her backup B and C inspectors are just other inspection companies. And because you're not available, she'll go with the other people rather than use the guy that works for you. Now, I have to try to manage these schedules. I have to try to figure out how to get things done in certain windows of time. Um, it makes it difficult to determine if the test is accurate. All right. You have a inspection scheduled at nine. You're supposed to uh, schedule to do a home inspection and radon drop off at 10. I'm sorry, you're supposed to pick up a radon test at nine. You're supposed to do a home inspection and put that radon monitor in another house at 10. I have no other available equipment because it's all in the field. I show up at nine o'clock and all the windows are open. The owner is not home. I have no idea when those windows were opened up. I don't know if they were left open all night. I don't know if they were opened up at 8 a.m. I don't know, but all I know is closed house conditions are compromised. The test results 4.2 for so for those of you who do radon tests, you know what that means. It's an arguable number. Uh, test tape shows that most readings are in the high or low to high fours, low fives, but then all of a sudden you got a bunch of hours that drop into the ones. What do you do? Remember, you're supposed to be doing a radon test in an hour and you have one piece of equipment. Do you report this as 4.2 and you move to the next test and you start over? Do you tell the realtor you got to start this test over again, which means your second one gets backed up? This is the one of the issues of adding the additional services, adding the equipment to your office to make sure that you are prepared in the event that something happens. On another test, I had a septic inspector, um, a septic inspector I hired go out to do the septic inspection. My radon test was in operation when he was there. Now, I know the septic inspector pretty well. So homeowner was was home, by the way, the owner is a realtor. He's working in the basement. He's a part-time realtor. Um, he's working for another company. My septic inspector called me as he walked out of the house said, hey dude, uh, basement windows are open right by the guy's desk. Now that's 15 feet away from my monitor. And I said, you sure? And he goes, uh, yeah, I'm dead positive. They're open. I went back to pick up the radon test the next day. Every window in the house is closed. The test result was 2.8. Now, did this owner cheat? How do I address this? How do I intelligently act 
upon my findings to present the information to my customer. All right, water testing. In Ohio, the, and probably like many states, it's fairly easy. We grab a water sample. It's gotta be in an approved sterilized container and we submit it to an Ohio approved laboratory for review. My opinion, the biggest challenge I face is making sure I properly explain to my client what a well test actually does. Uh, I did get a angry letter, I will say it that way, from a client who received information from his realtor that the water test would do more than just check for bacteria and E. coli. That is what our water test was doing. The client moved in, client was looking for the results on uh, iron and all the other garbage that's in the water. And I said, we don't do those tests. He goes, well, I feel like I kind of, his, his exact words to me were, I feel like I kind of got screwed. I paid you all that money for the water test. For the record, it was 100 bucks. All that money for the water test and I didn't get anything I thought I was getting. Now, that could be my fault because I obviously didn't explain to my customer properly what we were going to do. That also means I did not educate the realtor on what we were going to do. If that test fails, coliform. You probably all know the lab will check for E. coli. It has to have a minimum of 28 hours of lab time. Again, we have to be able to manage the timing of our services to make sure our contracts are, are maintained, to make sure inspection periods are maintained, to make sure that our clients know what services we can and cannot provide. This E. coli and bacteria thing led me to understand that sometimes FHA and or VA want, <coughs> excuse me, lead nitrite nitrate testing done. That was a way again for me to add additional confidence to my presentation to be able to explain to the customer what needed to be done possibly to even educate the underwriter and the processor of what the rules were for fha and va and then to make additional money from the test all right it is not a bacteria account it's strictly a pass and fail all right Again, I think the biggest issue we deal with is timing and what does the water test consist of? Another issue I've experienced is how to explain the results to the clients. Um, multiple tests that have failed. Owners and realtors expecting us to explain and diagnose for them why the test was failing. I don't know, it failed. Get somebody in there now to, to do the next step. All right, I gotta make sure samples get to the laboratory on time. I have to make sure, at least in uh, most of our labs cases here, they close at five o'clock. They're not open on Saturday to take a water sample. I can't take a water sample Friday at one and then schedule another home inspection at four if I can't get to the lab before they close. If I do, the test will be invalid by Sunday morning and we're gonna be starting all over. I need to make sure that I'm explaining to the realtors properly to do not bleach the well before I arrive. Bleaching of the well may mask the result and it may cause the test to come back as invalid. All right, septic inspections. Oh, with the wrong way, sorry, 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 there it is. Now, in all fairness, I'm going to be very honest, these inspections actually make me uncomfortable because a septic inspection costs several thousand dollars to repair or replace. In Ohio, they did me a favor. Uh, 2015, they passed a stupid, wonderful ordinance that basically says there's a state, I think the word is certification to do septic inspections, but each county can then have a separate additional certification. So if you work in eight counties and you wanna do septic inspections in each county, 
you have to have eight different county certifications plus the state. And oh, by the way, there are nine fees attached to that. And each county can charge a different fee. So there are a couple of my, the guys that I work with do septic inspections that do not service a couple of our outlying counties. I mean, they've flat out told me, we don't do enough inspections in that area to justify the expense that the county wants. All right, so part of the reason these make me uncomfortable is I hear different septic companies, septic inspection sessions talk about opening the lid, doing this, doing that, um, all this great detail about how to do an inspection. And then at least where I live, I watch the inspectors go out and dump dye into a toilet. And they flush the toilet and they go look to see if they can figure out where the dye is going to. That's it. That to me is not really understanding if the septic system work, what the ins and outs are. It is a dump dye flush toilet. Make sure that all the sewer lines and drain lines are connected to the septic system. All right. My report needs to be specific as to how I'm inspecting the system. As I said, they basically dump dye and flush toilets. Now, I had a repeat client who hired us to do the home inspection, termite inspection, water test, and septic inspection. And by the way, the client was present for the inspection. The problem was the septic inspector was not there when we did the home inspection. He came in later that afternoon. About six months after the inspection, I get a call from the client. The client has said, look, I've used you before. I'm satisfied with what you did the last time. I said, okay, the way you phrase that means something's wrong this time. And he goes, having a septic issue. So I mean, quickly, I looked up the report and I could see that the septic inspector had cleared the system. Client said he was having a backup in his house and he had called a septic cleaning company out who said the system was, was full. The septic cleaning company said that uh, he had explained uh, that they had had great difficulty in opening the septic tank lid and suggested to my client that the lid had not been opened for some time. Now, I'm not the septic inspector because of the specific rules in Ohio, I stayed away from the septic system, but I hired the inspector to go out the inspector clears it. Now it appears to be a conflict and the client's angry at me. And I said, well, let me get you in touch with the septic inspector who swore up and down that he had opened the lid. Now, did he? I don't know. Did he not? I don't know. I wasn't there. But the short end of that story is client said, well, you'll probably never hear from me again on any other inspection. All right. I hired the septic inspector to add value to my service. That value backfired in this case because I probably lost that customer. All right. Now, Kenya, how are we doing on time? Good? Hey, hey, yes, so. we are. We have 40 minutes. I do have some questions if you want to take them right now. Yeah, that'd be great. Sure. Okay, so the first one was, uh, uh, what does an FHA consultant do? Okay, um, so the answer to that question, and I, again, folks, please forgive me, but 203K, and for those of you that belong to InterNACHI, probably know the name Catherine Hall. Uh, she puts, has founded an organization called the National Association of FHA Consultants, and she is trying to educate and train inspectors on how to get onto the HUD approved inspector list specifically for rehab type loans and rehab projects. Um, Catherine started as a home inspector, has run a very successful home inspection business and is basically doing nothing more than these rehab loans right now. So when somebody's buying the house that 
needs to be rehabbed. And, and here's one way you may be able to look at this because I'm going to jump ahead a couple minutes on this one is you've gone out and done the home inspection. Your client is doing an FHA loan. The roof cannot meet the FHA um, certification rules, will not meet structural conditions. Um, say it has a bad septic. All of a sudden the deal is going to blow up in smoke. The idea of the FHA 203k loan is to help the buyer take those um, areas need serviced, find out the cost, roll them into the loan, get the service done, keep the loan, keep the realtor happy. So the FHA consultant is a specific FHA or HUD approved inspector to deal with FHA uh, properties. Hope I answered that okay. Thank you. The no. next one, um, this one, is there a separate pet inspection software that we would need to invest in to write the report? I assume he means just- All right. Go ahead, I'm sorry, Kenny, go ahead. No, I, I, I was just saying, uh, it doesn't say pet inspection, but I don't okay. know if that's what he meant. I think if in regards to termite inspection or pest inspection, NPMA 33 is the basically universally accepted termite inspection report. Now, I know that we have both uh, Home Inspector Pro and uh, 3D software. Uh, our old version of 3D software had that report in it. So you can buy the F or the NPMA 33 software or the report. There's also, I guess, handwritten versions of that report out there. So to answer your question, there is a specific report if you want to do termite inspection that you must get. NPMA National Property Management Association 33. That's the one that VA and FHA look for. Um, next one says, how do you pay your inspectors when you add these services to the home inspection? Hold that, hold that question for about 25 more minutes, 30 minutes, okay? <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, one L, as a beginning home inspector, what do you recommend to add at first? Okay, great question. And again, give me about five minutes. I'm going to answer that one. That's coming up, I think, okay? Okay, last one so we can continue is, is there, is it 16 hours for radon only for home inspection? Okay, in Ohio, now remember, let me stress the word Ohio. Uh, if you wanna be a radon tester under the current rules, and again, I'll stress current rules because there is talk that they may be changing those in Ohio. We are required to have 16 hours of CE credit every two years. Now, it may be different in Indiana, it might be different in Illinois, it might be different in Florida, different in Arizona, whatever, but in Ohio, that's the rule, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's continue. All right, thanks, Kenya. All right, so FHA VA certification inspection. So I started that out by saying, how do you get business from that nasty old FHA and VA appraiser? Um, well, the appraiser inspects the home, finds suspe suspected roof-related issues, they may require a roof certification be provided. Who orders that certification? Again, typically the lender. So once again, I go out to look at a home to purchase. I am using FHA financing. I hire the home inspector. The home inspector comes out, to go back to I referenced a minute ago, Catherine at the... Um, um, FHA 203K consultants says, know what the FHA minimum standards are. If you go out and you've got an FHA loan and you stop and you look right at the roof and you go, there is no way that roof is going to pass FHA standards, which means it must be watertight and have a minimum life of it. And I think it's still two years. It could be three now, but say it's two, it has to be able to perform at least two years and be watertight. If you've got missing shingles, uh, surface damage, curling and cup shingles, there's no way that's going to pass. At that point in time, do you continue on with the home inspection 
knowing that the appraiser who's going to come in in a week or two from now is going to come in and put a check mark on the form. And when they check that box, it says, recommend further review by qualified roofing inspector. That form's going to hit the lender's box. The lender's going to pass it up line. The appraiser, somebody's going to go, oh, box, check, boom. Send a message back to the realtor that says, hey, Joe, get a roofer. We need a roofing inspection done. Now, the roofer comes out. And this, again, in the old days, I always said it had to be by a roofer. The roofer comes out. The roofer says, we can't pass this roof. We got to tear it up, put a new roof on. That's going to be $10,000. Now, the loan is not going to happen until the roof is replaced. So do you address that again that's what Catherine was saying do you address that in the very beginning and get the roof rolled into the 203k loan or does suddenly somebody have to be a certification provider i as an inspector who does fha certifications when asked i have to go out and put my neck on the line that says when i go out to sign that document i am guaranteeing the government that this roof does not need to be replaced for a minimum of two years and will remain watertight. That's what a roofing certification does. If you wish to do them, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to tell you right up front, err on the side of caution because it only takes one phone call after the buyers moved in to say my roof is leaking and the roofing contractor says the roof needs to be replaced. If that's the case, you bought it. You will be replacing the roof unless you've got a buyer that is really a compassionate person. I did not have to replace a roof. We had to replace a section of a roof under that type of a circumstance. All right. Why is the home inspector providing the certifications? Because the home inspector is very knowledgeable. We are used to inspecting roofs. They can reach us. They can find us. They know we'll go look at a property. It's, and we don't have a vested interest in it where the roofer, first of all, if you can get them to go out and look at it, has, they have a vested interest in replacing the roof. All right. What's it take me to perform a roof certification? I have to get on the roof. I should be prepared to get into the attic area. I need to be able to access the condition of the attic. And I have to be willing to ensure that there's no issues and no issues will occur during the time of the guarantee. All right. As I said a minute ago, unless I'm 100% sure that it's going to last two years and remain watertight, I will not certify the roof. I hate to say that. I cannot do it. Now, there may be ways you can find around that, but I'm going to be honest and tell you again, if you're going to guarantee that certification, you have guaranteed the government that you are being truthful and honest and you are subject to fines and jail time, if not. All right. I would say roof certification used to be my biggest um, moneymaker there. From the FHA point, it's not a, it's now it's the structural end of it. Uh, that is the, and again, I just referenced structural inspection. Where that comes from, termite inspector finds termites, checks the box. A, a appraiser sees, or the appraiser sees that, appraiser, or appraiser sees termite damage, checks the box. Underwriter sees the check on the box, they require somebody to come out and do the inspection. If you on this call and on this meeting, if you are a structural, licensed structural engineer in your state, you are sitting on a lot of money potentially because you will be a requested person if you make it known that you are comfortable doing these types of certifications. All right, appraiser goes out and finds bowed basement walls, uh, finds steel beams installed in walls finds water in the basement, finds water uh, stains on the walls. Any of these types of things, the appraiser may check the box and says, I need further review by qualified licensed structural engineer. Now, I currently have a list. I wanna say the list is five long of structural engineers. 
and I can't find them half the time to do the work for me. I have one that uh, has been, we've been working with for 20 years. And right now I've left him a message uh, four hours ago and I still have not heard. Oh, there he is. Finally got back to him. Um, he finally got back to me a little bit ago. So, I mean, there are things out there that can, that, that we can do, but you need to look for these people. You need to be prepared to explain what services they need to do, what you expect of them. I will tell you the biggest thing I would tell you to do is give them a business card with your name on it or, or with your company name on it and their name on it. You do not want them giving out their business cards because that's what I would lost business from was I had generated a lot of referrals from the structural end and the engineer was going out passing out his own business card and realtors started to bypass me and went right to him to do the next inspection and I lost that referral business. So I would tell you that if, it, if you potentially have septic inspectors that you're subcontracting with, structural engineers you're subcontracting with, whoever it would be, I would probably try in your initial meetings with them. Guys, I wanna give you business cards with my company name on it. We'll, uh, you know, if we need to, we'll come up with a report with my company name on it. You are working for me, not for them. And you need to continue to allow me to keep the customer. All right. I just went over why. You might find steel beams installed. You might find termite damage. Uh, foundation water seepage. Uh, Praise is concerned about basement floor cracks. Uh, and, and here's the fun one. The appraiser or the home inspector finds that the ranch home is actually a manufactured home. Now, there was a day eight, nine, 10 years ago, we did numerous. And again, that's where I think the engineer kind of took the business out from underneath us. We were doing numerous referrals of manufactured homes where people were buying ranch homes and all of a sudden the appraiser was finding out, hey, that's a manufactured home. We need a structural engineer to verify that's tied down so that it can't roll over in a windstorm. That is another reason why a structural certification may be requested. All right. Um, we want when they call the home inspector, and I actually got the call when I just talked about the engineer. This call came about 30 minutes before our session started today. Realtor in a dead panic. Ranch on slab, buyers concerned as a structural issue. Uh, they had tried to line up a quote engineer to go do the inspection. They got the date confused. So the engineer is not available till next week. Friday is the inspection deadline. She is desperately trying to find somebody that can do an inspection. When she asked if I had a structural engineer, if I was a structural engineer, I said, no, I am not personally one, but I have people I work with who are. And we're trying to see if we can't get into the business. And then for the very record, I know who the realtor is. She is not on my referral list. But I'm hoping that if we can pull something off, we can get her into our referral list. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Here's another, even though this may not be a certification, another common lender request. Remember, we're talking about expanding our marketing of our business. And we all keep talking about realtors. Well, why are we missing the lender? VA has become the FHA. FHA used to require a termite inspection on everything. FHA stopped doing that. VA is now requiring that. So whenever the veteran is buying the home, they have to get a termite inspection. All right, why aren't you doing the termite inspection? You should do it. Here's the, a big thing to remember though. Under the current VA rules, they require, sorry, that the veteran not pay for the termite inspection. So you need to be prepared to finance that, or you need to be prepared to ask the seller to pay for it, or be prepared to ask the realtor to pay for it. If not, you run the risk of it going to closing and the report magically winding up at the closing and the invoice she just so mysteriously didn't make it to the closing office. And at the end of the day, three months later, you look and you see you have an outstanding bill, 
and you didn't get paid for the job. VA uh, termite inspections have become another quote unquote lender requested inspection in our database. All right, what about mold testing? Again, do we offer it? Will you offer it? If not, why not? Um, I'm sure all of you as inspectors on the phone, how, can, how may I help you today? I wanna to schedule a home inspection. Great, tell me about the house. What city is it located in? Uh, does it have a basement? Yes, do you have any major questions or concerns on the property? And the client says, do you guys check for mold? Now, what a very great open-ended loaded question that is. So realistically, do we check for mold? Yes and no, because you can't really check for mold unless you take samples. That's my opinion. Um, do you check for moisture? Yep. Is moisture a cause of mold? Yes, it is. So do you charge for a visual inspection? Do you only charge if you're taking samples? Again, do you offer mold testing? And then do you have insurance to cover it in case you miss it? Uh, do you understand how to explain the report? Do you understand the ramifications or the potential questions that may come up from the mold reports? All right, what's it take to do a mold test? Typically, it can take a swab. It can take an air pump and it takes a laboratory. Uh, geez, we can buy bags of swabs. You know, the, the, you go to the doctor and you get a um, strep throat test. That's a swab. Uh, air pump sold by companies like ProLab, you know, the very big supporters of InterNACHI, uh, what, $399, give or take, I think, for a, a mold pump. The air cartridges are about five bucks or so a piece. Uh, you need a lab that will review the sample. You need a lab that will prepare a report for you. The mold testing can give a peace of mind to the buyer or the lender that no mold issues exist. Go back a couple of slides ago, the appraiser goes out, the appraiser sees uh, water stains in the basement, sees black stains on the basement wall. They check the box, mold testing. Again, real like who does mold testing? What does it cost? What are they gonna do for me? They call you now you can, and by, at that point, by the way, does any seller wanna pay for mold testing? Absolutely not. Does the seller want to pay to mold, remediate their home? Again, absolutely not. So you need to understand when you talk to the realtor, what type of test can I do? What does it, what's the value to the realtor? What's the, the, the um, ramifications to the owner? And what does it mean to the mortgage company to make sure the loan gets closed? All right, again, who orders the mold test? Typically it's the buyer. Typically somebody with mold allergies. Um, maybe somebody's experienced a water damage or a water leak issue, such as flooded basements, roof leaks, plumbing leaks. All right. Again, we talked about the appraisal with the black stains. Um, do you want to be part of that action? All right. Sewer camera inspections. Uh, this is the last and latest add on to our business. It seems like this is the up and coming thing. I will say about 10 years ago, well, 15 years or so ago, and when I would go to the national conferences, it was mold testing. About 10 years ago, it seemed to be infrared. Uh, the last couple of years, it seems to be the sewer camera business. Why did I get into it? I got into it because people were having sewer line issues and they were having a hard time finding a plumber to do the inspection. Now, where I live, and I know a friend of mine in Detroit is telling me the same thing, there are some plumbers that have jumped onto this also, and they are advertising doing sewer camera inspections for $89 and $93 a piece. I know what they're doing. They're trying to get the door open to get themselves into the door of a home because if they find the issue, they have the customer in a fear factor moment to sell them the additional business. I get it. We are not in that business. We are in the education business, not in the repair business. So I tell everybody up front, I can do a sewer camera inspection. 
I am not going to tell you there's something wrong unless there is, but I also cannot fix it. All right. Why it took me two years, I want to say, from the moment I wanted to do it to get into the business. And that was because of the cost of the equipment. Sewer Cameron's, the one I own is $7,500. It's a, I think, a very good camera. Some of you probably use it. It's the Wohler camera. Um, again, United Infrared is the one that I worked with to get the camera and took one of their, you know, I, I call it the short training classes. And all of a sudden, I'm a sewer camera expert. Yeah, right. You're trying to learn what you're looking at when you're in there. Um, hoping sometimes that I'm seeing things the right way. This business, just like whether it be termite or just like any other add-on service, this type of industry has done a lousy job of continuing education for us inspectors to learn and improve our business. The home inspection business, wonderful. We go to the InterNACHI conference, do a fabulous job about talking about electrical and plumbing and heating and roofing, do a great job of that to make us all better home inspectors. We don't do good jobs as an industry of actually putting on a session to talk about how to do a good termite inspection how to do a good sewer camera inspection, how to do a good uh, mold inspection. We don't do good jobs of that, of educating our members. And I'm speaking out of, out of my own opinion there. And that's probably my biggest concern when I get into this, what are some of the issues? It's been the cost of the equipment and lack of knowledge of some of maybe what I'm seeing when I'm down in that sewer line and knowing is that a problem in the line. God love us if we see a root. God love it if we see something that obvious. It's one of those things that you're not sure of. It's the first time you looked at a basement wall. It's got a, a horizontal bow and about a half inch of bow in it. Is that a problem or not? Those are what the industry is not doing a good job of teaching the rest of us as we go along. All right. Why did I get into it? I didn't want to let the realtor or the buyer call another specialist. I have now added two realtors to our list this year simply because they asked, hey, do you do a sewer camera inspection? I said, yes, we do. They go, great. We need you to come out and do a sewer camera. And both of those have added now two home inspections since January 1st. All right. Why did Peter at United Infrared suggest we get in this? We're already looking for the main sewer clean out. We've already scheduled the inspection with the seller. One of the values to our realtor is you don't have to make another appointment for somebody to come back out. You scheduled a, wrote a contract with a very limited inspection period. You don't have days to allow a plumber to get here or to go find somebody else to get here. You need to get somebody in here. Well, guess what? The equipment's in my truck. I can go do it for you right now if you'd like. And here's the additional fee. All right. If we do the inspection, we might be able to resolve a possible concern without disrupting the sale any more than necessary. So now to go to kind of our last two areas of this presentation, somebody asked the question, how do I pay my guys? How do you pay somebody? I'm kind of getting to that, but one of the things I struggled with for many years and to be truthful about it, I kind of became this in our company is do you want to have an inspector specialist or do you want to be that person? How do you handle that? If you're a one person shop you and you want to add services, you need to be ready to be qualified, competent, and capable of doing each service you promote. If you want to hire inspectors, you need to decide, do you want your inspectors to do all the services or are they just home inspectors or what do they do? So the, the last paragraph on this page, I hopefully is going to address the one question we just got a minute ago. When I started the business, sorry about the phone in the background, guys, sorry. Um, hang on.
Sorry. I'm afraid you're going to hear a phone call about a car warranty a second in a minute. Um, when I started the business, I used to hire and I would take my inspector to bees and we would train them to be home inspectors and termite inspectors right away. And I really realized, and it took one or two claims, to be honest, for me to realize that maybe I was doing them in it a, a unfair, uh, I was being unfair to the inspector, that let them learn to be a home inspector and then train them as a termite inspector. So I went a completely different direction after a while. I said, I'm hiring you to be a home inspector. And my life of a home inspector is kind of this way. The first year, they're a sponge. They want to learn everything they can about the business because they really are excited about it. The second year, they kind of go, eh, I feel pretty good about this. I think I kind of know enough. I'm getting a little bit cocky right now. I don't need you as much to help me. I can survive on my own. And the third year, that employee says, hey, you know what? I think I'm able to go on my own. Hopefully, I got some realtors recommending me. I'm either going to go on my own or I'm going to make life a little more difficult for you, those types of things. So when I, I sat back and said, well, wait a minute, let's get these guys able to be a good home inspector first. So I stopped training them as a termite inspector right away. All right. The other thing that did for me is I also admitted as a home inspector that I would go out and look at something and I was like, God, do I really know what I'm looking at here? Please, Mr. Klein, don't ask me because I'm not sure. Boy, am I glad you didn't bring that up because I really am not sure what I was looking at. As a trainee or whatever you want to call it, I was having guys and gals in the field that might have felt the same way. I remember a very specific example one day of I had gone to a job to do the I was there doing the termite inspection and my inspector pulled me aside and he goes, hey, need help. I go, what's up? He goes, is that a sump pump over there? Well, those of you that have, I'm sure have all seen them, a sewage ejector pit looked like a sump pump, but he didn't know it was a sewage pit. He thought it was a sump pump. So he, before he called it out wrong, he wanted to be sure of his answer. We, by doing it that way, I was able to get him to understand I was there to help him. And I helped him know how to explain to the customer so that he act, looked intelligent and, and um, good. And so the client had confidence in him. That's the other reason. When the, my new guys would go out and they weren't sure if they were looking at a termite or they weren't sure if they were looking at a carpenter ant, it allowed me to come in behind them so that I could see it, show them, and gave them more experience. So hopefully the answer to the question that came in, the first thing I'm probably going to train my inspector to be, if, or if I want them to add on additional service, is either termite or radon. Now, you may need to know your marketplace. In where I live in central Ohio, we do not have a lot of termites. We have a, a fair number of carpenter ants and carpenter bees. By the way, those are on the termite report. We have a lot of radon. Um, from what I've been told, the farther south they go, not as much radon, but a whole lot of different types of termites. So from what I've been told, if you live in New Orleans, you better know how to do a termite inspection. If you live in Florida, you better know what, it, you probably should know how to do a termite inspection. If you live in Illinois, you better be familiar with radon. You know, the farther north you go, the termites don't like the weather. So it just depends on maybe your marketplace and understanding what your clients and or realtors may be recommending. I hope that answers your question. All right. You may have extra services. Uh, I'm sorry, the extra services may require training, licensing fees, and other expenses. I'm going to be honest again and tell you folks, I probably didn't do the greatest job of always providing training for all of my staff. There, there needs to be training done to help your members of your team or you understand more about your business. The licensing fees, again, I am a business. I have to account for my budget. I need to remember that I'm going to spend X number of dollars a year on licensing. I need to have X number of dollars a year allocated for continuing education. These are things I must be able to do. And I will tell you, 
that I've always had this approach in the company. I wanted to have at least two people capable of doing a service. Now, I told you we're a company of two. We do everything. We can do every service except for one. I do the sewer camera. My other guy doesn't want to do it right now. So that way, if somebody were to quit, couldn't come to work, we would have coverage. If I wanted to go on vacation, I wanted somebody to be able to do a radon test or a, a, a termite inspection or a mold test. I need to be able to take care of my customer that way. All right, some other what I call additional considerations. What if you're a multiple employee company? Are all your employees going to be providing the extra services? If so, do they all have the appropriate equipment to do the service? So let's say you're gonna offer home, termite, radon, mold, sewer camera inspections, and you've got four inspectors and you, your scheduling service books the call and the customer says, well, I only want home and termite inspection. And you have two of the four employees that do um, septic, I'm sorry, that do radon and, and mold and sewer camera. So you assign the job to employee C because all they need is termite and home inspection. Employee C goes to the job. Now the clients have had time for the last two days to sit and think. And they said, you know what? Now we want a radon test. Now we want a sewer camera inspection. Employee C on the job does not have the equipment. What do you do? Does that mean you have to hire or arrange a second visit to the job? Does that mean you potentially miss the contract period? Uh, how do you handle that? So when I say, are you have to make a decision if you're going to hire extra employees? Is everybody doing the same service? If so, then you need to budget for the expense expense of, those, of that equipment. If you want to buy everybody a $7,500 sewer camera, are you able to do that? You know, do you need a $400 uh, mold pump? Do you need a $1,000 or $1,500 radon camera? That's the stuff that you have to decide there. Or are you literally taking the order and then hoping that you get it all right and that the customer doesn't want to add the additional services later on. I'm trying to answer the other question that somebody asked about that. All right, does your employee get paid for the training or do you just pay for the CE classes? Uh, I'll go ahead and answer it now. Right now I pay for the CE classes, I don't pay for the training day. So, if somebody is taking the two days or three days to go to the InterNACHI conference this year, I'll be paying for the course, but not their time at the course. Um, those are decisions, again, that you have to make. When you, Again, I know I understand that that's not so much marketing the value of the service, but if you want to add the service to your, your list, you need to be prepared for those expenses. Does the employee belong to appropriate local, state, and national associations? So again, personally here, I pay for my inspectors InterNACHI membership. I pay for my inspectors Ohio Radon Association membership. I pay for my inspectors Ohio termite license. Those are all in their individual names, but I pay for those. I pay for them to go to the CE class to get their training, to keep their, their uh, accreditations up, but they will pay for the time that it takes to go to the class. All right. Another important thing is what if your employee provides a service and doesn't get paid? So I'm again trying to answer the one question about how do I pay my, my employees, as I think that's coming up again in a second. Um, what do you do if VA requires or do we all know what VA requires for termite inspections? I already told you, VA requires the veteran not to pay for the service. So if I have a buyer who's purchasing a home through home with home inspection and termite and they're a VA vet, I now am immediately texting the seller's realtor and saying, because it's VA financing, it is my understanding that the seller is to pay for the, or is to provide a termite inspection. Would you like us to do it when we are on site? If so, our fee is this amount of money. 
and we would prefer that the seller leave a check or provide credit card number at time of inspection, period. Now, 95% of the time that is considered acceptable and the seller's agent will immediately text me back and say, yep, go ahead and do it, we'll leave you a check. Every now and then I get, what do you mean VA requires the seller to pay for it? That wasn't in our contract, right? Every now and then I get, well, the seller doesn't want to pay for it. They want it to go to closing. You have to determine what do you do if it sends it to closing and it doesn't close. All right. I kind of jumped through this slide here, guys. So bear with me. For the record, I pay my inspectors for the service, even if it doesn't close. It's a sore spot with me, but I also believe that my employee going out to do his or her service wants to get paid for what they've done, just like I do. So I kind of look at it as a cost of business that a few times a year, I'm probably paying for an inspection that didn't get paid on the other end because the deal fell apart. That is why I no longer, as I said, I always ask the seller and the realtor, do you want us to do the inspection? I also now have gone to the point, and I understand it's more time on my behalf, but I'm immediately asking, I need the title company name, email, phone number, and contact. And I want the mortgage company name, email, phone number, and contact, because I will send the invoice to both of those parties that says we did VA termite inspection, and there is an amount due for this property, because I'll make sure that that uh, invoice gets into the closing that way and it doesn't mysteriously get lost by the realtor. All right. Just like at home inspection, what happens if there's a claim for the additional service? Here's one other difference. That $400 or $500 home inspection, when you get a claim of $1,000, it, it hurts, but it doesn't hurt as bad as when you get paid $75 for a termite inspection or $100 or whatever the number is. And all of a sudden you get the $1,500 termite treatment claim. Who pays for it? If you have employees, do you share it? Does your employee pay for it? Who's responsible for making the decision? I go back to my friend Catherine a little bit ago. She said when she ran her business, she made the decision if people were getting their money back and her employees just had to accept that fact. I have another friend of mine who made that same judgment call on a job and his employee tendered his resignation the next day. So it just depends on what you are gonna do and how you're gonna handle your business. All right, I think more importantly, what happens if it's one of your good realtors? Um, you wanna keep the business? Do you refund the money? How do you handle with the employee? I have paid a couple of claims in the past. I do not make my employees pay claims. I'll be, again, be very upfront with everybody on the call. I probably underpay my employees because I account for the fact that I pay for their association dues. I pay for their well, uniforms. I pay for their equipment. I pay for their claims. You know, I take care of all of that stuff. So they get less money in pocket because I pay the other stuff on top of it. If there's a claim, I may chew on them. I may make them aware of the claim. But as of this point to this date, I've not asked for an inspector to ever pay for a claim except one time. And he was an idiot. He overflowed a bathtub and he was careless and he overflowed the bathtub. And we had to give back the inspection fee plus a little bit of work. And at that point, I said, look, man, you were just stupid. You owe me on this one. And he was okay with it. All right. So before I leave you, I want, I would be amiss if I did not re remind you of the most important thing to do when adding extra services, charge for your services. Nothing's going to drive me more insane than, he, than to hear of an inspector who does the termite inspection or any other service for free. Why would you do this? Your time is how you make your money. Get paid for it. Those of you who've had to deal with an attorney, does the attorney do it for free? No. Does an accountant? No. I remember the claim that was against us and our insurance company assigned us to an attorney because I'm not allowed to pick my attorney. I had to educate the attorney on what a home inspection is all about at my expense. So 
charged for your service. You put your name on a report and there's a claim against it. You need to get paid for that service. All right, think about your profit margin for your business. Let's remember that restaurant example from earlier. Where did the establishment make their money on that meal that I went to? It wasn't from the meal. It was from the wine, dessert, and the appetizers. Yes, early, way back college days, I worked at, for those who remember the old name, Bonanza. I worked at Bonanza. We were charging a buck and a half at that time for a, a fountain drink. It cost us 11 cents for the fountain drink. We made our money on drinks, not on the steak dinner that we were serving. All right, every service we do can improve the money that we make as a company and our employees. So back to the question somebody asked me, do I train my inspectors to do extra services? Yes, I will. Do I do it immediately? Not anymore. But for every inspection that is done in the field, the inspector can make home, his home inspection wage, the wage for adding on the termite, the wage for doing a radon test, if they want to do a mold test, if they want to take a water sample, they can add on additional services to their wages to make money. All right. In the example of a mold test, what are you charging? The lab fee is about $27.50 for the lab I use. Again, I referenced the Marauders Pro Lab. The UPS overnight fee for the one I shipped out this morning, $45. The cost of the air cartridge is approximately five bucks. I got about $78 in it. If I want to make 15% profit, I've added about 12 bucks. I'm at $90. Now, if I'm a one person shop, I charged $90 for the sample. I made 12 bucks. Okay, guess what? It took me 30 seconds to 10 minutes to take that sample and make 11 or $12. That's not bad. I'm, I'm okay with that. I want to make more, but it's not bad. But what if I have an employee doing the service? Let's assume you're paying them by commission. So again, do you pay them by commission or do you pay them by flat fee? If you're at 40% commission rate, the $77 adds on another $31. Now I'm at $108 when I add on the commission. You want to add the minimal profit? I'm at $125 right there. What's the cost of the, if you have a company vehicle, do you provide uniforms? Are you budgeting for claims? Is there licensing expenses in there? Is there training expenses in there? Is there continuing education costs? If so, is that part of the 15%? If so, did you really make money? Goes back to what I'm saying, <clears throat> you're a business. Charge for your service, treat this like a business. You're gonna add services to your business, not to your home inspection. You are a home inspector that is a home inspection business. All right. Every time you give away a surface, a service, I mean, you have, you, uh, or you do a service at a loss, you actually cost yourself money. Keep that in the back of your mind. If you want to make money, you got to make money. All right. Compensating your staff, and this will be our last couple of minutes. Difficult topic. If you're a one-man shop, you get compensated every time you get paid. So you can dictate what you want to charge. If you're having a bad week and need some money, maybe your rate went down at the end of the week. If you have inspectors, you need to make money for yourself, and you have to make your employees money. Hey, Ron, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure we have these last few minutes to do that raffle. Okay. All right. Um, hang on. I, you know what? I'm good right there. If you need me to cut out, I'm really good. But as I wrap up with that, just charge for your service, folks. Understand you're a business. Um, I want to thank everybody. I'm sorry, I ran just short of time. I was two slides away from being done. All right. If there's any other questions, Again, you have my email address right there. Feel free. You can send me an email. I will try to get back to you and, and answer your questions, okay?